and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Our guest today is team lead of NLR Seek at the nonprofit Two Blades, Helen Brabham. Hi, Helen. Hello. Great to have you with us today. Um, we like to start with a little icebreaker at Computomics podcast here. And I was wondering, since I've been told that you're quite the voracious reader and love music, what's the last thing you read or heard that inspired you? Oh, gosh. Wow. Starting, starting strong. Um, <laughs> actually, the latest book that I've been reading was an introduction to economics, which is very mm -hmm. different to science. Um, but that's been really great at sort of thinking very differently to how we do in science. So it's great to get out of the sort of micro world of plants and plant pathogens and think about the human interaction in the wider world as well. Um, so, yeah. And then in terms of music, yeah, I'm really looking forward to a couple of festivals that I have um, coming up in the summer. So I usually work hard in the lab and then spend my summer um, dancing away uh, to good music. <laughs> I love that. So if I had to choose a festival to go to in the in the UK, which one would you recommend and why? Oh, definitely Glastonbury. If you can mm. get a ticket, that's uh, I think the oldest and largest music festival in the world. And it's just, yes, yeah, such an incredible large space with a whole mix of music genres and just really wonderful people. Oh, it sounds lovely. I'm a huge festival fan myself. So maybe uh, <laughs> after we finish this interview, <laughs> uh, away from you, treasured audience of the Computomics podcast, Helen, and I might uh, talk uh, festivals a little longer. For now, though, I'm, I, I'd be curious to know a little more about your work. Um, I introduced you as a, as a team lead at nonprofit Two Blades. Um, can you tell us what does Two Blades do? What are you about? Sure. Yeah, so Two Blades um, is a nonprofit organization and sort of operates in this real unique space between academia and industry. So what we aim to do is really discover and um, advance the scientific technologies that are being discovered both within house, but also with our other academic partners and really facilitate the translation um, of this science into the field and into crops. So in particular, we work with disease resistance and so finding ideally genetic based solutions uh, to improving crops so that we can reduce the amount of fungicides that are being used um, and improve crops in the fields to have higher yield as well. So in particular with our model, so we um, partner with industry for large collaborations as well, but we ensure that any of the solutions and the science that we develop um, is available to those that need it the most. So in particular, um, smallholder farmers as well. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask how how do you get those solutions to the farmers? So, uh, you know, you've kind of described what you're what you're providing, but um, how do you connect the research that you do with uh, like on your own or with your partners to the end user, if we want to call them that? So working for over 20 years, uh, we've been able to develop a really broad collaborative network. So this spans partners across industry, across academia, but also uh, partners for regulation and deployment as well. So as a small organization, we can't do everything ourselves. So mm. our strength is really connecting people there. In particular, one of our uh, most recent programs that we're launching is to look um, at soybean and soybean rust in Africa and are actively working with uh, multiple partners to sort of make this happen as well. Can you go into a little more detail? Maybe that's a good example to kind of show how you work and what you're at, obviously uh, taking into account anything you are uh, allowed to share if there's still kind of proprietary issues or something like that. Sure. Yeah. So the um, Africa Soybean Programme um, is being led by Camille Vitek, also based here in Norwich. And they're um, really actively working to develop collaborations across multiple countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. That's both, you know, on the regulatory side, um, but also with institutions and scientists um, that are working directly in the field as well there. So there we're taking um, the knowledge that we've been able to gain because we've worked in the Asian soybean rust for a long time now. Mm -hmm. So we have that expertise and access to germplasm and really uh, connecting those resources uh, with people down in the field. 
Mm-hmm. Interesting. And the NLR Seek uh, project that you're the team lead of, what is what is that about? Yeah, so that was a real exciting development. So we've worked within disease resistance for a really long time. Um, and the benefit you know, that we have within that is within the field and within academia, we know quite a lot already about resistance. And so this is the innate immunity from the plant. So plants have immune receptors that recognize pathogens, um, and these are different classes of genes. And so for a long time, we could find these in genomes, we could predict the sequences, but there's often hundreds and hundreds of gene candidates. And so just looking at any individual plant, it's really hard to predict which are going to be functional. Mm-hmm. And so advances um, that we had in particularly with the NLR-Seq program was the discovery um, of a signature of functionality. So working with uh, Matt Moscow, and he was looking at NLR-based resistance in barley and wheat. And so NLRs are one of these particular classes of resistance genes. He found that um, actually these are highly expressed genes, um, even when the plant is not infected. So they are expressing these resistance genes sort of all the time. And the ones that are the most highly expressed are the ones that are functional. And this might seem quite obvious, but actually, um, based on previous literature, this was quite unexpected. So because these genes can cause a defense response, which often ends in cell death, Mm -hmm. for a long time, people thought, well, this has to be really tightly controlled in the plant so that they don't accidentally get triggered and cause the plant to die. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, looking more closely at the data, we found that if you just sequenced Um, a plant and looking at um, the gene expression, you could predict which genes are more likely to be functional. Interesting. So whether it's, it was going to be the resistance, resistant genes or other uh, traits? Yeah. So if you're looking just at the expression um, of those resistance genes, then the ones that are expressed more highly are more likely to be functional. Um, And this, we found, was observed across many different plants as well. So it was a very conserved signature. And so we did a very large proof of concept experiment where we took 18 different wild grass species. So these are wild relatives of wheat. And we sampled um, across these populations and cloned a thousand new resistance genes that we predicted were more likely to be functional. Mm -hmm. And we transformed these into wheat with our um, industrial partner, Kaneka, who developed a highly efficient wheat transformation pipeline. Mm -hmm. So we've ended up with a library of transgenic wheat with individually a thousand new resistance genes to test. And so we tested this whole library um, against STEMREST with our collaborators in the University of Minnesota. And we found, yeah, many new resistance genes against STEMREST, which was a great proof of concept um, experiment to show that there's something in this signature that will help us really uh, rapidly identify new resistance genes. That's super exciting. So what are what are the next steps? Because, uh, I mean, those are already huge <laughs> milestones, yeah, huge yeah. results, right? So so where is the project headed uh, kind of in the near to mid future? Yeah, so it's super exciting that we're able to find these new resistance genes. Um, and so we've now got practical resistance that we can deploy in the field as well. So we've started with stem rust. We're currently screening against um, other rust species as well. So these are major pathogens of wheat, of which there are very few resistance genes that have been cloned previously. Mm. Uh, We're expanding across other diseases in wheat as well. So in the end, we'll have a practical collection of validated resistance genes that we can build gene stacks with. But not only this, and this is why we've partnered with um, Computomics as well, is that this is now an incredible data set um, of genes that we can investigate further. So we want to see if we can improve our prediction. Is there anything we can pull out from the sequences of these genes themselves and that will help us predict even better um, when we move into other species? Um, But also we can use this for multiple experiments in the lab um, as well. So we really want to understand 
how these genes are recognizing the pathogens as well. And so to do that, we can go into the pathogen and sequence the pathogen and try and find the genes that are being recognized. And so there, with many experiments in the lab, we can find out the exact parts of the genes that are responsible. This could mean that we've got new gene editing targets as well. Um, so really broadening uh, the use of this of this data. I think with the new advances that we've got with machine learning and, and protein kind of structural modeling, mm -hmm. it's super exciting at the moment. But the real limitation in the biological side is that we need a very large, robust data set. And so many people have done lots of really great work cloning new resistance genes from different species, but these have all been done under different conditions um, and have different parameters, which makes kind of pooling this data very difficult because there's a mm -hmm. lot of unknown variables. Whereas now we've got this incredibly large data set, you know, of a thousand gene validated in plants that makes it um, yeah, really good foundation for exploring with machine learning to hopefully get some really great insights. You know, in my mind, like in, the, in my inner eye, I see this this mountain of gold, like a dragon's hoard uh, of data. And <laughs> instead of instead of hoarding it like the fantastic beasts uh, um, of lore, um, you you share it with Computomics, mm -hmm. and then um, I assume as part of that pilot project, you will um, share the results with the world in some form. Um, are there any concrete plans on on how to share the results of this pilot project that Two Blades has with Computomics? Yeah, so we have um, a publication which is currently in press. So we will um, have this data released. I mean, I've uh, presented at quite a few different conferences now, the concept and the pipeline. Um, so yeah, we're, we're always open to new collaborations and, and discussions with partners as well. And ideally we'd like to uh, put these genes into wheat and have gene stacks. And so to do that, um, we're partnering with the Sainsbury Laboratory. So based in Norwich here, we are embedded within the Sainsbury Laboratory um, and in collaboration with um, the Gatsby Charitable Foundation, they're really pushing forward, getting these genes out uh, into the field. Very nice. And so those will be accessible for anyone who wants to work with them. Yeah, so the publication is out. So those gene sequences are um, yeah, accessible if anyone also wants to look at that data um, as well. And so moving forward, we'd really like to expand into other crops as well mm -hmm. um, to see if we can build much larger gene libraries to really get an insight um, into how these uh, resistance genes are functioning. Mm -hmm. How do you go about selecting those other crops if it's already in, in the process? Like, uh, how do you decide is it going to be maize or is it going to be, I don't know, bananas? I'm thinking of bananas. I don't know if that's a good example, but like, how do you go about um, choosing the next crops to go into? Yeah, I mean, we'd love to work on everything and solve all the problems <laughs> of the disease. But um, yeah, well, I think we're always limited with uh, prioritizing um, based on the team and the resources that we have. Um, so in particular, it's it's where the need is, really. Um, so when we have industrial partners, um, you know, it, it's what challenges they face as well for particular crops. We know major diseases. Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking at gene solutions as well, I mean, it's great that we're building this gene library, but for deployment in the field, it depends if certain crops, you know, you've got regulation for um, GM crops or whether you'd have to have a cisgenic solution or whether it's um, through introgressing these resistance genes through traditional breeding as well. So mm -hmm. for any crop um, and any pathogen, you know, there's, there's all these other considerations to take into account. And I think that's where, you know, our model of sitting in between academia and industry, we get super excited by the science, but there's also that practical element of, okay, well, is this useful and can this go into the field um, right. as well? And um, so you have an internal process too, because th those are quite a quite a few variables that <laughs> um, yeah. that need to go into the decision making process. So um, how how do you organize that at Two Blades? Um, is there a committee that takes all of these into account? Do you have maybe a machine learning algorithm that spits out a prioritization suggestion? Um, how can we envision, uh, or can we look behind the scenes? Will you give us an insight? 
yeah, that would be great. Some kind of yeah magical machine learning pipeline to say go after this. Um, but really, I think we're limited, like everybody, with with funding as well. So um, where there's a need and there's funds, and we think that we can help, great. You know, I think that our flexibility is um, we're a small team, but very dynamic. Mm -hmm. So we can set up new assays, new new um, crops and also pathogen species as well. Um, currently, you know, thinking off the top of my head, one of the um, recent epidemics is wheat blast. So this is a different fungal pathogen. Mm -hmm. um, and a few years ago, you know, major epidemics. Uh, developed in Bangladesh and also then in Zambia as well. And mm -hmm. so I think having this responsive or the ability to be responsive to what's actually happening in the wider world and go after, you know, these real economically important pathogens, mm -hmm. um, yeah, is 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 good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that must be exciting to, to be able to make such a, a relevant impact in a relatively short time. Um, to have that be be part of your part of your work, um, I'd be interested just thinking about who listens to the podcast. Um, there might be representatives of potential industrial partners out there um, who are wondering, oh, maybe I wasn't even aware of Two Blades. Um, we have this exciting challenge or th this information. Um, is there a process for people to get in touch with you or um, or to kind of, yeah, maybe maybe just suggest projects or suggest a partnership? How how does that work? Yeah, definitely. So um, you can head to the website, which is uh, twoblades.org. And so there you can find a lot more about the organization and um, other projects we've had previously as well and sort of how we work. And yeah, we are a small team, but we do have um, you know, our business development manager as well, Apollonio, who's more than happy to receive <laughs> an email from anybody. Um, but yeah, so we yeah, we always want to keep that conversation going as well mm -hmm. and I think then yeah having our wide network you know even if we can't help directly we might have you know another academic partner who has more information or we know is working in that field as well that's cool we'll, we'll definitely put it in the show notes as well so uh, if you don't have a chance to jot that down while you're listening in the car or something uh, feel free to hop by the show notes um, later uh, to check that out um I'm also intrigued always about what makes people go into their field. Everyone probably heard it, heard your smile, heard your passion in your voice, and I can see it on the screen right now as well. What what made you go into this this area, like plant diseases? Uh, what what motivated you to go into that field? Yeah, I think that's always a, a funny start. So I um, went to university, and I actually picked to study zoology because at the time. I thought, great, love these little fluffy animals, want to see how <laughs> they live. Um, but actually the joint or the first year was joint between biology um, and zoology as well. I think learning more about plants and how they function, I thought, ah, actually, that's a bit more interesting. <laughs> so I switched <laughs> to biology. And then from there, yeah, we had a plant disease module. So understanding, you know, how uh in particular focused on fungal pathogens, so how they grow and really infect the plant. And I really like this interplay, um, yeah, the interaction between plants and microbes. So sort mm -hmm. of went from there and followed my interest on to do a PhD and sort of the rest is history. I think a lot of it is, <laughs> yeah, I'm very fortunate um, mm -hmm. and able to study what I find um, really interesting. But then outside of that academic side and what brought me to Two Blades is, is actually getting an opportunity to make a difference in the field as well. I think with plant disease, when you can see a resistant plant versus a susceptible plant and you can understand, you know, how that resistance is working and how you can improve that resistance to actually then be able to improve yields and deliver food is, um, yeah, very exciting. Uh, yeah, I can totally. Yeah, that's very <laughs> relatable, even if I'm I'm not in the scientific field, but just to to have that kind of impact and be able, it sounds cheesy, but to help the world in a way, right? Um, yeah. Like help address one of our huge challenges um, in, in the world um, uh, is, is very exciting. Um, do you see any innovations, relevant innovations on the horizon for, for plant science? Uh, yeah, I think that's been an incredible uh, journey so far. So I think from starting my PhD, I did a lot of gene cloning, um, very kind of, yeah, hands-on in the lab with um, PCR and cloning that way. 
And seeing then the technology developed, we're now synthesizing genes and coming up with, you know, incredible innovations. And even over the last few years, you know, we've had um, AlphaFold and protein structural modeling um, to now, yeah, with machine learning as well. It's just been an exponential increase in the mm-hmm. field. And I think that people are doing some absolutely incredible stuff in the lab with, um, you know, a, a lot of um, in silico work and computer modeling and then validating that in the lab as well. There seems to be a lot less constraints um, on some of the things that we're using. And I think the real challenges there won't be in the innovation. It'll actually be in the regulation and mm. the deployment because I know, you know, we've got incredible solutions in the lab, but we can't put them in the field um, at the moment. So I think it's ensuring that, you know, we we really translate the incredible and discoveries so that they have a real world benefit. Mm-hmm. Definitely sounds a challenge worth taking and something we could probably talk about maybe in a year or two years time <laughs> when uh, maybe you'll return to the podcast. Um, is there anything else? I mean, if you've already shared so much and and we have the Two Blades website to go to, is there any other project or resource that you would like to point our audience to that you found helpful or that you find exciting? Yeah, I think just highlighting um, some of the work that we've been doing in Two Blades. So we don't just have uh, the lab in Norwich here in the UK, but we also um, have a lab in the University of Minnesota in partnership there. And and there, the project is really focusing on corn and mycotoxins um, in corn as well. So that's where the fungal pathogen infects. And it's not only the loss from um, the infection, but it actually the pathogen releases uh, toxins as well, which are detrimental to humans. Um, so yeah, so that's some of the other work um, that we've been working on, which is very exciting. Great, thank you. Um, we'll maybe, if possible, include an extra link to that in the in the show notes. Um, apart from that, I can just say thank you so much, Helen, for for your time for taking us on a journey <laughs> into the work of Two Blades, your work and that of your colleagues. And I hope you'll be back at some at some point. So maybe we can talk translation and uh, other current challenges. Yes, great. Yeah, I hope to come back when we've got uh, the results of our collaboration with Computomics as well. And yeah, who knows in a few years when we've got these new resistance genes um, out in the field. Perfect. Thank you for listening in today. Want to learn more? Then check out our show notes and more info on Computomics.com. If you have questions or want to propose a next guest, please reach out to us at podcast at computomics.com.